and go. Welcome to this worship service for First Parish Church of Kingston, Massachusetts. I'm Christopher Stokes and I'm a member of the stewardship team. Together we are sharing in a worship service to begin our pledge drive, the time each year when we pause to carefully consider the gifts each of us receives from this community and the ways we give to support it. We are joining with Unitarian Universalist congregations across the country to share part of the service created by our UUA president, the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, and a virtual choir directed by Jen Heyman, who is the music director of All Souls Church in Washington, DC. Jane Ford is going to lead our chalice lighting today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Stewardship Sunday. We light our chalices today with these words from Reverend Lois Van Leer. We light this chalice not because we must, but because we may. We light this chalice not because we have the truth, but because we are each, because we each come bearing and seeking many truths. We light this chalice in connection across culture, distance, class, and language. We light this chalice that our religion may be a beacon of light, hope, and justice. We light this chalice to kindle our hearts and our minds. Thank you, Jane. Our time for all ages for today comes from Reverend Susan Frederick Gray. So I'm going to share the video clip with you now. I'm joining you here from First Parish in Cambridge. And I wanna thank the First Parish community and Reverend Adam Lawrence Dyer for offering their space to us. First Parish sits on the occupied land of the Massachusetts people. A community of the Massachusetts people still live in Massachusetts in the community of Canton. I have a story for you today. And there's two things that are important about this story. Number one, it's a true story. And number two, it's an anonymous story. So I read this story many years ago in Yes! Magazine. And the author of the story was listed only as Jane B. I love this story because it speaks to the fact that even in incredibly difficult circumstances, that the presence of love, that acts of generosity and hospitality really are life saving. Here's Jane's story. Jane and her brother grew up in the 1940s in Hollywood, California, a town known for show business. Now, Jane says that she and her brother were adopted by their parents, not because their parents loved children, but because their parents thought it completed the image of the perfect Hollywood family, a beautiful home in Beverly Hills, a fleet of servants, two adorable children, and a little spaniel dog. Jane and her brother hardly ever saw their parents. They were largely raised by the housekeepers and nannies. It was only on Sunday when the whole family went to the country club. There, Jane and her brother were expected to be perfectly well behaved, not to run around or get dirty, to know which piece of silverware to use at every course, to be seen but not heard. They were taught to speak only when spoken to. Looking back, Jane said of herself, I wasn't a real girl. I was a cardboard cutout of a girl. Jane's best memories from her childhood were when she was with her grandmother. And one day, her grandmother took her to a rummage sale in a church basement. Now, this was Hollywood, California. So this rummage sale was filled with costumes and fancy clothes that were from the movies or from movie stars. Jane's grandmother gave her $2, which was a lot of money at that time, and said, buy whatever you want. 
Well, Jane went home with two armfuls of things. And as soon as she got home, she ran straight up to her room with all of that loot. And she started trying things on. Finally, she settled on a little pink night dress, a big broad hat, white satin gloves, and every piece of costume jewelry that she bought. She looked at herself in the mirror and Jane was awestruck. She looked like a different person. She decided to give herself a new name, Madame Modifus. Now, whereas Jane was quiet, Madame Modifus was bold. And whereas Jane was shy, Madame Modifus was flamboyant. And whereas Jane always did exactly as she was told, well, Madame Modipus, she had a mind of her own. Jane, all dressed up, ran down the stairs across the yard to the house next door and knocked on the door. When the mother next door and her little son opened the door, their jaws fell open. Jane said, my name is Madame Modipus. May I come in for tea? Well, the mother and her son, they welcomed Jane into their home. They played for hours and then Jane went back to her house. Now, any time that Jane had a little bit of time to herself, she would get all dressed up and she would run to the neighbor's house and they just came to call her Madame Modifus. Jane ends her story by sharing how she now is a grandmother and that one of her favorite things to do is to visit her own grandchildren and that whenever she goes to see them they wait for her outside on the yard and when she pulls into the driveway they jump up and down and scream her name Madi 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 the only name they've ever known her by We also today have some virtual choir music to share, which was produced, as Chris mentioned earlier, by Jen Hamet. So I'm going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, I'm going to share the first of those pieces with you all.
will help me know my name. To follow that beautiful music, we now have a sermon offered by our UUA president, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, who did the Time for All Ages just a little bit ago. Yes, love is what I need to know my name. These words from the artist Seal capture the meaning of our story today. The story of Jane and her discovery of her full self and her real name, Maudie. Jane's story captured my attention the first time I read it. Her words, I wasn't a real girl. I was a cardboard cutout of a girl. They stayed with me. It's clear the trauma and the pain of her home life. And this isn't unique or even uncommon for children, for any of us. So many of us know these experiences in our home lives, in our work lives, or in the stifling cultural conditions of oppression that seek to make us small, quiet, invisible. Conditions that seek to rob us of our fullness. But then something happens for Jane through the love of her grandmother, the generous embrace of the neighbors, and a little bit of imagination, Jane's full self, Madi, finds expression. The freedom she experiences is in moments, those moments when she's able to steal away from her house and go to her neighbors. But it is enough, these small moments of joy and love in the midst of the neglect and the suffering they are life-saving. Zora Neale Hurston writes, love makes your soul crawl out from its hiding place. And that is exactly what Madi's soul does. She is loved into the fullness of her being. I hear echoes of my own story in this story. And maybe you do too. For me, in a time of tremendous difficulty in my life, my UU church was the neighbor's house, full of warmth and welcome, music and imagination. And the grandmother? That was my Sunday school teachers, whose love and care, coupled with joy and attention, it made a difference in my life when I most needed it. That congregation, that community, those teachers, they helped me find my voice, my spirit, my soul. They loved me into being. I imagine that you too have stories like this. How Unitarian Universalism, its theology, its people, its ministry changed you, saved your life, helped your soul crawl out of its hiding space how it helped grow the size of your soul. As process theologian Bernard Loomer so powerfully describes, by size, I mean the stature of a person's soul, the range and depth of your love, your capacity for relationships. I mean the volume of life you can take into your being and still maintain your integrity and individuality. There's so much expansiveness and generosity in Loomer's definition of the size of your soul. And he goes on, he says, I mean the strength of your spirit to encourage others to become freer in the development in their diversity and uniqueness. I mean the magnanimity of concern to provide conditions that enable others to increase in stature. You see, Loomer is not just talking about individual growth and liberation. And this matters to us as Unitarian Universalists because our faith has never been solely about individual spiritual growth. 
As Unitarian Universalists, we understand salvation not as individual, but collective. We recognize the fundamental interconnectedness, interdependence of all life and of humanity. Foundational to the core theological idea of interdependence is that mutuality and responsibility are inherent to who we are as human beings. We are not islands. And our tradition calls us not to individual freedom or transformation alone, but to the liberation and thriving of all people. One of the most important and successful campaigns within Unitarian Universalism over this past year was You, You, The Vote, a national effort for Unitarian Universalists to partner with local grassroots organizing and voting rights groups on an unprecedented voter engagement, voter registration, and voter turnout effort. It was the first ever effort like this on our part as a larger association, and it was awesome. But here's something you may not know about You, You, The Vote. When I first shared the idea for You, You, The Vote at the 2019 General Assembly, I didn't know if it would take hold. I was simply throwing out a seed of a dream, imagining there before thousands of you, congregational delegates at GA, I asked, what if we as UUs helped engage and mobilize one million people to vote in the 2020 election? When I said that, it was scary. It seemed impossible. And in fact, the next time I talked about you, you, the vote at a local congregation, I reduced the number to half a million. But before we'd even started to create the team and the infrastructure, where when we were still just talking about this idea, congregational leaders, ministers, religious educators, and members were clamoring to volunteer. Financial gifts began coming in, some unsolicited. Folks were ready to say yes, ready to give generously of their time and resources because they knew that our values of justice and compassion, that our system of democracy and the literal lives and well-being of our neighbors, of our loved ones, of each other were on the line and on the ballot. Thousands of people volunteered thousands of donors came forward from our congregations, many of you, and together we invested tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of hours and well over a million dollars to vote love in the 2020 election. And in the end, we reached well over three million potential voters, far exceeding our wildest dreams. In what was the largest, most transparent and accessible election in our history, we UUs played a significant role. And we were likely the largest, most organized, faith-based, pro-democracy effort during the election. Wow. Imagination, generosity, commitment, collective action. These fueled you, you, the vote. But there was also some magic to it because it recognized our strengths and it invited us more fully into who we are. For we are the people who show up we are the people who work together in community. We are people who believe in democracy, who understand our faith as active, who are concerned about the conditions of justice here and now, and who, when it comes right down to it, are a hopeful people. We are a hopeful people about what is possible and about our agency and capacity to meet the challenges of our time. 
Some of the magic of you, you, the vote was that together we were loving each other into the fullness of who we are as Unitarian Universalists. But this isn't the end of the story. It is a reminder. It is a glimpse of what is possible when we say yes. When we say yes so generously and powerfully to what we believe in, to what we care about, to our ministries, our values, and when we choose solidarity, interdependence with wider networks of people working for justice, compassion, and liberation. From the beginning of my time as UUA president, I have said, this is no time for a casual faith, no time for a casual commitment to what you love most, and this is no time to go it alone. You, you the Vote is just one example of what it looks like to take our faith, our values, and our commitment to interdependence seriously. It is life-saving, life-changing ministry individually in our own lives and revolutionary when we bring that powerful yes out into the world. And this yes, this yes is what is needed so deeply in our communities and our world right now. To love our society, to love our world into a new place of being. In her important book, Cast, Isabel Wilkerson explores the conditions of racism, white supremacy, and racial hierarchy as an American caste system. And in her book, she quotes Gary Michael Tartikoff, an American scholar of castes, who says of the United States, this is a civilization searching for its humanity. It dehumanized others in order to build its civilization, and now it needs to find its own. There's power in those words and that history. So how do we find our humanity as a society, as a country, as a civilization? The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said the key was love. By love, King did not mean a sentimental or romantic kind of love, but rather an overflowing, audacious, and unconditional love that sought the fullest unfolding of every person. King said this love might well be the salvation of our civilization. The only way that we overcome the forces of racism, domination, discrimination, dehumanization, the forces that are at the foundation of the United States, those forces that have the effect of dehumanizing our society, the only way we overcome those forces is to turn to the deepest source of our humanity. And as Unitarian Universalists, we know that that foundation, that source of our humanity is our compassion and our interdependence, our mutuality and relationship and responsibility to each other. In other words, I would take Bernard Loomer's words and King's words and say, we need to grow the size of our love. And by size, as Loomer says, I mean the range and depth of your love, your capacity for relationships. I mean the volume of life you can take into your being. I mean the strength of your spirit to encourage others to become freer, to provide conditions that enable others to increase their stature, the size of their love and their soul. And this is where the real spiritual depth and calling of our faith lives. Not just as an intellectual exercise, but as embodiment. 
embodying and growing our capacity for this powerful form of love that encourages all of us to live into the fullness of our being and that is committed to the conditions that make this fullness possible for everyone. Compassion, interdependence. Looking back, the love of her grandmother, that trip to the church rummage sale, and the generous, inclusive embrace of her neighbors made a powerful difference to young Jane, to Madi. Looking back, the warmth and magic of my UU church and the love and care of my Sunday school and youth leaders shaped my life and my calling in ways that I will always be grateful for and will never be able to repay. Looking back, you, you, the vote became this incredible source of community, joy, and positive action in the midst of what was one of the most traumatic times in our lives. It drew us together in unprecedented ways and was a lifeline. And this is not the end of the story. It's just a glimpse, just a few stories to capture some of what is possible in all of our congregations when we say yes, when we say yes boldly, audaciously, powerfully to our values, to our spirits and our love, and to one another. These stories and more are happening all across our congregations. None of us, none of us will ever know all the difference that our generosity to our congregations has made to the lives of our children, our families, our elders, to the lives and conditions of our larger communities. We'll never know all the ways that we have helped make a difference. When we give boldly, generously, audaciously of our financial resources as we are able, we make our values and our ministry manifest in the world. When we give generously of our hearts and our care and our love to our children and families, elders and adults, young adults and youth, we change lives. We save lives. And when we dream big, as leaders and staff about the impact we are called to make in the wider world, lives are changed. The material conditions of our communities can change. We are changed. We make it possible, loved into fullness, loved into being. May we keep saying yes boldly, courageously, and lovingly to our values and our faith. May it be so. You may have spiritual practices of your own that help you to do this work of growing the size of your soul and the size of your love. We have a reading to share with you about one practice you may undertake in this season, and Jane Ford is going to offer it for us. Before I do the reading, I think I know, and you may also, I need to take a deep breath. That was just an amazing presentation and touched my heart in a way because I came to this church about 10 years ago, uh, right after my husband died, and this church, through the past decade has really brought so much love and caring to my life. And now I'll do the reading. It's from the Reverend Do Dr. Rebecca Parker, sharing why giving generously of her financial resources is an important spiritual practice in her life. She says, I have come to believe giving of my income is so worth doing, not because there are good causes that will flourish, if I'm able to share my resources. Though there are, and I believe it's important to do. There is a deeper, more fundamental spiritual reason why I give, why I tithe, giving 10% of my income to the common good. 
I'm not suggesting tithing in spirit, tithing in principle, a tithing is a metaphor. I am suggesting giving away 10% of your income. It can be difficult, but it can be learned. In fact, I don't think that anyone who ties has come to it by anything other than learning it. In fact, I lost my place, hold on. In fact, I don't think that anyone who tied through, oh, okay, we did that. If, you, if you've never done it, start at 1%, then 2%, or three. Work your way to 10%, step by step. You don't have to give it all in one place. You can give part of it to your church and part of it to people and places that work for the healing and transformation of life. <clears throat> I became aware of the deeper, more fundamental spiritual reason to tithe when listening to a member of the first congregation I served. Steve DeGroot told of first tithing because he had been taught it was the right thing to do. And then because of what people he admired did. But then he said, I matured in my faith. I came to my own reason for tithing. This is why I do it now. I tithe because it tells the truth about who I am. If I did not tithe, it would say that I was a person who had nothing to give. Or I was a person who received nothing from life. Or I was a person who did not matter to the larger society. Or I was the person whose life's meaning was solely providing for my own needs. But in fact, I'm the opposite of all these things. I am a person who has something to give. I am a person who has received abundantly from life. I am a person whose presence matters in the world. I am a person whose life has meaning because I am connected to and care about many things larger than myself. If I do not tithe, I, lose, I would lose track of these truths about who I am. By tithing, I remember who I am. This is the endangered knowledge in our culture that can be preserved by religious practices that teach us a different sense of who we are. Hey, good morning. I'm Audra Shattuck and I'm a member of the stewardship team. These words from Rebecca Parker and Steve DeGroote offer us a way to think about giving and even tithing which is different from the old models of doing what we were told without any choice in the matter. Giving generously, knowing that the dollar amount is individual to each of us, and so are the choices of where and how to give, is a practice we can celebrate together as a way to affirm that we all matter in the world and have gifts to share because we have received the gifts of life and love. We take time in every service to share an offering and in every year to make pledges to support of a congregation. Pledges are different than contributions. Although we value and appreciate contributions in all forms, we cannot make plans based on contributions. Pledges allow us to create a budget, which is a way of demonstrating how we will put our resources to work in the world. We commit to being good employers of our religious professionals. We care for our historic buildings. We fund the programs that help members and friends of this church enjoy fellowship, nurture young people, and offer classes and discussion groups where people of all ages can learn and grow. You will be receiving an email today with an invitation to pledge using an online form. Pledge responses will be stored where only the collector can see them. And of course, there will still be an option to print out a paper pledge form. Our pledge drive will run from March 28th to April 18th this year. Please pledge earlier in that window if you can to help the budget committee in their work. And please know that all pledges are valued and appreciated. It takes all of us to sustain this congregation where people can love, be loved into being. Today's music comes from Loved Into Being Virtual Choir. Enjoy. You're broken down and tired of living life on a merry-go-round. Find the fighter, but 
Again, I need to catch my breath. That was just beautiful. And now it's time to extinguish our chalice. And we extinguish with these words from John Morgan. In the end, it won't matter how much we have, how generously we've given. It won't matter how much we know, but rather how well we live. And it won't matter how much we believe, but how deeply we love. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Audra and Chris. And my gratitude to Reverend Susan Frederick Gray and to Jen Heyman and to all the people who worked to offer those parts of our service today. 
I am going to stop the recording now and we will have an opportunity to share joys and sorrows in community with each other.